The following is a DW Ancient Babylon production. October 28th, 539 BC. The Persian king Cyrus the Great approaches the gates of Babylon, the final target of his campaign to take Mesopotamia. By this time, nothing compares to the vastness of Babylon, a city described by Herodotus as having a hundred gates, whose walls stretch 56 miles, are 80 feet thick, and 320 feet high. A city whose people are glutted with wealth, who spend their time in celebrations, rejoicing in endless dance. Such was the immensity of her scale that Cyrus, it was later claimed, would seize control of the outskirts without anyone in the center even being aware of his arrival. And so it was that Babylon, the largest city in the world, fell to the Persian Empire without a battle. Join us as we take you back to where it all began, a story involving numerous empires. From the dawn of civilization to the death of Darius III in 330 BC, while focusing on the artifacts, the literature, the religions, and the kings that made the Near East the cradle of civilization. The topics of this episode include the chronology and geography of the ancient Near East. The absolute chronology of Near Eastern history is a difficult and controversial problem. The Mesopotamians were very good at providing sequences of rulers, but our difficulty remains in establishing a firm point in time in which they can be attached. First millennium chronology is secure due to a record of a solar eclipse that took place on June 15, 763 BC, which allows scholars to backtrack from reliable data but the absolute chronology of the second millennium and before is uncertain. Just keep in mind throughout this series that although we have a relatively reliable sequence of events based on Mesopotamian king lists, that sequence cannot be absolutely dated with certainty. We will be using the most commonly used dating system, which is known as the middle chronology. Unlike the ancient Egyptian culture, the Near East developed writing early on and the clay tablet, the medium of writing that developed in southern Mesopotamia, was adopted by all Near Eastern cultures. These tablets have incredible durability in the dry soil of the region, and the survival of hundreds of thousands of these texts distinguish the ancient Near East from other ancient cultures. If you followed our Ancient Egypt series, you noticed our emphasis on the great tombs and on archaeological works. Literary works in Egypt were written on parchment and papyrus and did not survive well throughout antiquity. With the ancient Near East, we have more literary sources. Prehistoric Developments We begin our study of the chronology with the early Neolithic human occupation of Mesopotamia, which was confined to the foothill zones of the Taurus and Zagros Mountains and the upper reaches of the Tigris and Euphrates Valleys. The Fertile Crescent was inhabited by several distinct, flourishing cultures between the end of the last Ice Age, roughly 10,000 BC, and the beginning of history. Farming arrived in the fertile lowlands of Mesopotamia from 8,000 BC onwards, and it transformed human society. For the first time, people were able to see the revolutionary potential of an agricultural way of life. Within a few centuries, the development of irrigation allowed the idea of creating settlements to spread into central Mesopotamia, ultimately reaching the rich alluvial lands in the south, where the first cities were eventually to emerge. The expansion of farming settlement is reflected in a sequence of prehistoric cultures, each of which was characterized by a distinctive pottery style. Hasuna, Samara, Halaf, and Ubayid. Noting geography, one of the oldest known Neolithic sites in Mesopotamia is Jarmo, 
settled around 7000 BC and broadly contemporary with Jericho in the Levant and Chatal Huyuk in Anatolia. Other early Neolithic sites such as Samara and Tel Halaf were in northern Mesopotamia. The Hasuna Period The Hasuna Period, which occurred around 6000 to 5500 BC, marked the emergence of the Hasuna culture in northern Mesopotamia. During this time, agriculture and sedentary village life began to develop, characterized by rectangular houses and the production of pottery and stone tools. The Samara Period During the Samara Period, between 5500 and 4800 BC, the Samara culture saw the rise of settlements and larger communities. Circular or oval houses emerged. Pottery production became more refined, featuring intricate designs. The Samara culture witnessed advancements in irrigation techniques and the cultivation of crops such as wheat and barley. The Halaf Period the Halaf period, spanning from 6000 to 5400 BC, witnessed the spread of Halaf culture across northern Mesopotamia, Syria, and southeastern Turkey. This period marked the development of larger and more complex settlements, including urban cities. The Halaf people engaged in extensive trade, and their distinctive pottery featured intricate painted designs. Additionally, specialized craft production including metalworking, began to emerge. The Ubayid period The Ubayid period between 5500 and 4000 BC is characterized by the emergence of the Ubayid culture in southern Mesopotamia, particularly in the Sumerian heartland. During this period, large unwalled village settlements were established, featuring multi-roomed rectangular mud-brick houses. The first temples of public architecture appeared, along with a two-tier settlement hierarchy. The Ubayid culture witnessed the rise of the Sumerians, who initiated advancements in agriculture and irrigation systems, leading to surplus food production. Social stratification increased, and communal religious practices and an incipient accounting system emerged. The Uruk Period the Uruk period from 4000 to 2900 BC marked a significant shift towards urbanization and the development of city-states. Prominent cities such as Uruk, Eridu, and Or emerged as major political, economic, and religious centers. Monumental architecture, including ziggurats and large-scale temples, were constructed. Writing systems such as cuneiform were invented leading to the emergence of record-keeping and administrative practices. The Uruk period witnessed significant advancements in art, craftsmanship, and trade, with cultural influence extending beyond Mesopotamia. This period culminated in the formation of centralized states, with complex social hierarchies and the consolidation of power in the hands of rulers. The Early Dynastic Period the entire early dynastic period is generally dated from 2900 to 2350 BC, according to the Middle Chronology. The Sumerians were firmly established in Mesopotamia by the middle of the 4th millennium BC in the archaeological Uruk period, although scholars dispute when they arrived. It is hard to tell where the Sumerians might have come from because the Sumerian language is unrelated to any other known language. Their mythology includes many references to Mesopotamia, but little clue regarding their place of origin, perhaps indicating that they had been there for a long time. Akkadian gradually replaced Sumerian as the spoken language of Mesopotamia somewhere around the turn of the 3rd or the 2nd millennium BC, the exact dating being a matter of debate. But Sumerian continued to be used as a sacred, ceremonial, literary, and scientific language in Mesopotamia until the 1st century AD. The Akkadian Empire Around 2334 BC, Sargon became ruler of Akkad in northern Mesopotamia. He proceeded to conquer an area stretching from the Persian Gulf into modern-day Syria. The Akkadians further developed the Sumerian irrigation system. 
this world's first empire reached its zenith under Naram Sin, who began the trend for rulers to claim divinity for themselves. At around 2154 BC, the Akkadian Empire lost power after the reign of Naram Sin and was eventually invaded by the Guti from the Zagros Mountains. For half a century, the Guti controlled Mesopotamia, especially the south, but left few inscriptions and were not well understood. The Guti's most famous ruler was Gudea, who left many statues of himself and temples across Sumer. The Third Dynasty of Ur Eventually, the Guti were overthrown by Utuhingal of Uruk, and the various city-states again vied for power. Rule over the area finally went to the city-state of Ur when Urnamu founded the Third Dynasty of Ur, which lasted between 2112 to 2004 BC, and conquered the Sumerian region. His son Shulgi devised the Code of Urnamu, one of the earliest known law codes, three centuries before the more famous Code of Hammurabi. Around 2000 BC, the power of Ur waned and the Amorites came to occupy much of the area. Although it was Sumer's long-standing rivals to the east, the Elamites, who finally overthrew Ur. In the north, Assyria remained free of Amorite control until the very end of the 19th century BC. This marked the end of city-states ruling empires in Mesopotamia and the end of Sumerian dominance but the succeeding rulers adopted much of Sumerian civilization as their own. The Isen Larsa period. The next two centuries witnessed southern Mesopotamia dominated by the Amorite cities of Isen and Larsa as the two cities vied for dominance. The Isen dynasty, which lasted from approximately 2017 to 1794 BC, emerged following the fall of the third dynasty of Ur. Isin became the political and cultural center of the region. Under the rule of the Isin kings, the city witnessed a revival of literature, arts, and religious activities. However, their reign was marked by frequent conflicts with neighboring city-states, particularly Larsa. The Larsa period, which spanned from approximately 2025 to 1763 BC, saw the rise of the Larsa dynasty as a major rival to Isin. Located in present-day southern Iraq, the city of Larsa flourished economically and politically. The Larsa kings, like their Isin counterparts, were patrons of art and architecture. The Isin-Larsa period is characterized by power struggles between these two dynasties, with each asserting its dominance over the other. Eventually, the city of Babylon emerged as a powerful force, bringing an end to both the Isin and Larsan dynasties and paving the way for the rise of the Babylonian Empire under Hammurabi. This period also marked a growth in power in the north of Mesopotamia. Eshnunna and Mari, two Amorite-ruled states, also became important in the north. The Old Babylonian Period Babylon was originally a minor and relatively weak city-state, overshadowed by the older and more powerful states such as Isin, Larsa, Assyria, and Elam. This all changed when Hammurabi, who ruled from 1792 to 1750 BC, the Amorite ruler of Babylon, turned the city into a major power and eventually conquered Mesopotamia and beyond. After his death, the first Babylonian dynasty lasted for another century and a half, but his empire quickly unraveled. Babylon once more returned to the status of a small state. The Amorite dynasty ended in 1595 BC when Babylonia fell to the Hittite king Mersili I, after which the Kassites took control. The Hittites The Hittites occupied the ancient region of Anatolia, also known as Asia Minor, from 1650 to 1190 BC, and developed a culture that eventually expanded into an empire that would go on to threaten the ancient Egyptians. The Hittite Empire reached its peak between the reign of King Supapolima I and his son Mursili II, after which it declined, and after repeated attacks by the Sea Peoples and the Gasca tribes from the north, fell to the Assyrians. The Kassites The Kassites were a people who established a dynasty in ancient Mesopotamia 
ruling over the region for several centuries. They originated from the Zagros Mountains and gradually migrated into Babylonia during the 18th century BC. The Kassite dynasty, known as the Third Dynasty of Babylon, reigned from approximately 1595 to 1155 BC. They brought stability and prosperity to the region, adopting elements of Babylonian culture and integrating themselves into the local society. The Kassites' rule is notable for their patronage of literature and the arts, as well as their preservation of Babylonian traditions. However, they eventually succumbed to external pressures, particularly from the Assyrians, and their dynasty came to an end in the 12th century BC. Despite their relatively short-lived reign, the Kassites left a lasting impact on Mesopotamian history and culture. The Old Assyrian Period The Old Assyrian Period, from 2025 to 1364 BC, covers the history of the city of Asher from its rise as an independent city-state under Puzar Ashur I to the foundation of a larger Assyrian territorial state after the succession of Ashur Ubalat I in 1363 BC, which marks the beginning of the succeeding Middle Assyrian period. The Old Assyrian period is characterized by extensive trade networks and commercial activities, with the Assyrians becoming renowned as skilled merchants. They established colonies and trading posts throughout Anatolia, forging economic and diplomatic relationships with neighboring city-states. One of the key trade commodities was tin, which was crucial for the production of bronze. The city of Asher became a bustling center of commerce and administration as the Assyrians developed a sophisticated bureaucracy to maintain their expanding empire. The Middle Assyrian Empire the Middle Assyrian Empire was a powerful state that emerged in the 14th century BC and reached its height during the 13th and 12th centuries BC. It was centered in the region of northern Mesopotamia with its capital at Ashur. Under the leadership of kings such as Ashur Ubalat I, Tiglath Pileser I, and Ashur Nazarpal II, the Middle Assyrian Empire expanded its territory through military conquests and became a dominant force in the ancient Near East. However, the empire faced challenges in periods of decline, including conflicts with rival powers and internal strife. The Middle Assyrian Empire eventually weakened and was replaced by the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the 10th century BC. The Late Bronze Age Collapse The Late Bronze Age Collapse, from 1200 to 1150 BC, refers to a period of widespread societal collapse and cultural upheaval that occurred in the eastern Mediterranean region during the late 12th century BC. The tumultuous area saw the collapse or significant decline of several powerful civilizations and city-states, including the Hittites, Mycenaeans, and Egyptians, among others. The exact causes of the Bronze Age collapse are still debated among historians and scholars, but a combination of factors likely contributed to the collapse. These factors include natural disasters such as earthquakes and droughts, which may have disrupted agricultural systems and caused food shortages. Additionally, the region experienced invasions and migrations by various groups, including the Sea Peoples, who are believed to have played a significant role in the collapse. These disruptions led to the breakdown of trade networks, political systems, and centralized authority, resulting in widespread social and economic instability. The collapse of the Bronze Age civilizations marked a significant turning point in history, leading to a period of decline and fragmentation that lasted for centuries until the rise of new powers and empires in the Iron Age. The Neo-Assyrian Empire Assyria was in a stronger position during this time, and beginning with the campaigns of Adad narari II, Assyria again became a great power even to the point of overthrowing the 25th dynasty of Egypt. The Neo-Assyrian Empire, which lasted from 911 to 609 BC, became the largest and most powerful the world had yet seen. This lasted until the fall of its capital, Nineveh, at the hands of the Babylonians, Medes, Scythians, and Sumerians in 612 BC. After their final victory at Carchemish in 605 BC, the Medes and Babylonians ruled Assyria. 
the Neo-Babylonian Empire. With the recovery of Babylonian independence, a new era of architectural activity ensued, particularly during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II. He is credited with the construction of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, said to have been built for his homesick wife, Emetus. Whether the gardens actually existed is a matter of dispute. He is also notoriously associated with the Babylonian exile of the Jews. The Neo-Babylonian Empire, which lasted from 626 to 539 BC, would fall to the Persians. The Achaemenid Persian Empire The Persian king Cyrus II, Cyrus the Great, seized power of the Near East during the reign of Nabonidus in 539 BC. Nabonidus was such an unpopular king that Mesopotamians did not rise to defend him during the invasion. The Persian Empire, which lasted from 550 to 330 BC, developed a model for the administration of a large empire that would be copied by future rulers. By the time Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire in 331 BC, most of the great cities of Mesopotamia no longer existed and the culture had long been overtaken. Eventually, the region was conquered by the Romans in 116 AD and finally Arabic Muslims in 651 AD. This is the chronology we will cover in more detail throughout this series. Mesopotamia literally means land between rivers in ancient Greek. The oldest known occurrence of the name Mesopotamia dates to the 4th century BC when it was used to designate the land east of the Euphrates in northern Syria. Later, it was more generally applied to all the lands between the Euphrates and the Tigris, thereby incorporating not only parts of Syria, but also most of Iraq and southeastern Turkey. A popular perception of the Middle East is that the environment is a flat, monotonous expanse. In reality, geological conditions such as earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, along with wind and water, have created a highly diverse area. There is a long depression stretching from the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf in which the Tigris and Euphrates rivers flow, turning a desert into a highly fertile land. The Great Rift, which runs parallel to the Mediterranean coast, creates a narrow valley lined by the Amanis and Lebanon Mountains. The north and the east are dominated by the High Taurus and Zagros mountain ranges, which contain sources of all rivers in the region. In the south of the region is a huge flat landmass that contains the Syrian and Arabian deserts. These become more mountainous the further south one goes and are almost entirely devoid of water. Mountains, seas, and deserts created natural boundaries which could all be crossed, but only in limited places. The Lebanon Mountains and the Levant left a narrow corridor only for movement from northern Syria to Egypt. The Zagros and Taurus Mountains were massive barriers to the states of Mesopotamia and could only be entered through the river valleys. These mountains were the locations of uncontrollable people that often caused conflict with the states much like the later barbarians against the Romans. The Persian Gulf and the span of marshes at its head form the southern border of Mesopotamia. During the 5th millennium, Mesopotamians traveled to regions along the Gulf Coast. Sailing improved during the late 4th millennium and they became capable of reaching Egypt. By the 3rd and 4th millennia, direct trade contacts were common with the Indus Valley. The Mediterranean was tackled somewhat differently. Only a few harbors existed along the coast, none south of Jaffa. By the late third millennium, Aegean sailors had ships that could reach the Syro-Palestinian coast. By the second half of the second millennium, shipping throughout the eastern Mediterranean was common. Around 1200 BC, technological innovations enabled people from Palestinian harbors to sail the entire Mediterranean Sea. First millennium Phoenicians would take these innovations further and allow them to create colonies as far west as Spain and the Atlantic coast of North Africa. 
there is a debate that the Phoenicians could even reach the shores of North America. An even more formidable border was the Syrian and Arabian deserts. For millennia, Mesopotamians could only make their way along the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys and cross the northern Syrian steppe to reach the Mediterranean. With the domestication of the camel around 1000 BC, direct passage became possible, although infrequent. The lack of water resources forced armies to take the age-old roundabout route through the Levant to get from Egypt to Mesopotamia. Even if the desert could be crossed, the states of the Near East could not control its inhabitants. Like the dangerous groups in the mountains, these desert nomads were hated and despised. The Near East's position at the juncture of three continents allowed populations to easily enter the region. Tracking these movements, however, is nearly impossible. A group of people suddenly appear sometimes in a historical record. Determining their origins is often difficult due to the lack of evidence available. Maps from this series are available to our supporters on Patreon and are available for purchase on our website. We'll begin our chronological survey of the ancient Near East in the next episode as we discuss the origins of the city-state. Thank you for joining us. A podcast series is available for download at dwworldhistory.com. Here you will also find detailed outlines for each episode with additional resource material, maps, and bibliographies. Please remember to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our channel on YouTube.